Hey everybody, Josh from Soka here, and welcome back to another uh, edition of Marginal Gains YouTube. And this one is a follow-up on, I think, a really pretty popular one we did last week, and that is understanding the zero friction data sets. Uh, you all totally called me out. I said I would do it in 12 minutes, I think I said. I probably went more like 35. Actually, my camera stopped filming at one point because it only films for 30 minutes. Um, Adam clearly is rubbing off a little bit on me. <laughs> this is just a topic that is hard to cover uh, in a short period of time because it is so nuanced and there's so many questions that people ask. So we're coming back again. Um, I want to cover a couple things I didn't hit in the first video, but I also want to answer some of your questions because uh, I had a ton of really, really good questions. So first of all, let's kind of dive uh, back into the data set, I've got my screen recording here that we can we'll walk through. Um, one of the questions that, that came up, and uh, probably partially came up because I didn't get to the second part of the data set, was, you know, obviously half percent where is the limit of life of a chain? Um, what are the percentages that Adam's showing here in the blocks? Are they cumulative? Are they where per block? And the answer is both. Um, the chart we discussed last week, uh, these are the cumulative charts. This is the one that's on top in the data set. And so if we're looking at my screen here, I can go to like here, Soka Hot Melt. Um, block one contamination, 0.3% wear. Block two, 2% wear. Um, that two is the 0.3 from block one plus a 1.7% in block two. And where you can see that as we scroll down here, I've got wear by block and you can see the breakdown per block, 0.3 and 1, 1.7 and 2. This where by block uh, chart is, in a lot of ways, almost even more fascinating and kind of has more data within the data uh, than what we see in the primary chart. And one of the things that you can really catch here that I think is pretty exciting uh, is to look at the wear in a certain block, right? So dry, dusty conditions, block two, you know, what is my best option if I'm gonna go ride a long, hot, dusty, sandy, dry event? Well, let's just come to block two and kind of filter through and look, you know, what does less than 10% uh, here? And, you know, we've got the, the hot melts, 1.7, 1.1, um, Rex Black Diamond, four plus one does zero, Soga Hot Wax X does zero, um, you can really strategize your, your lubricant choices um, for a specific condition based on this per block use. The other thing that's interesting here is, you know, the so block two is the dry dusty. Block three is nothing, but we're not cleaning the chain after dirty block two. And so one of the things that like block three and then block five again uh, are measuring is how well the lubricant does at cleaning out, sweeping away the grit uh, or the water in the case of block five um, from the prior block. And so that's another good indicator of, you know, the, the, the success um, of the lube, not only as a lube, but also, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the, how many lubes out there say, you know, cleans as it lubes, and Adam has basically proven in every lubricant that claims to clean as it lubes that it just doesn't happen. Um, and I think when we really think about the mechanism there, that makes sense, you know. Um, you're going to have to have a lot of solvent or a lot of something to get the dirt out. Um, that solvent is displacing what would otherwise be lubricant. You know, I always wanted to joke. Uh, you know, you want your lubricant to be 100% lube, right? And things like, you know, pink is not a lubricant and, you know, banana fragrance is not a lubricant, um, right? That's, you know, if it's 1% if it's color and 1% fragrance, well, that's 2% lube I don't have in my lube. Um, you know, these are not in general uh, like water-based products where, you know, you're, you know, a lot of these like cleaners and things, right, we can add colorant because, you know, in a lot of cases you're as much as half water. Um, so it doesn't matter, right? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm taking a otherwise, uh, what otherwise would be water, I'm making it a color, I'm making it a fragrance, but with a lubricant, you really want that to be lubricant. Um, and we have seen, and I think our own synergetic test here uh, really shows that a lot of people have asked, you know, why did we move away from the needle tip in synergetic? And it was actually Adam's test here um, where he pointed out to us that uh, while synergetic did better than really any other wet lube, um, 
in the dry dusty contaminant, it didn't seem to clear that quite as well as NFS had done before it in the block three. And one of the things that he theorized and we tested and it proved to be true was that our drop size with that needle tip was just a little bit too small. And so having a little bit of excess lube per drop per roller was just helping wash through um, some of the grit and dust that had gotten in there. And that really, if you think about it, makes sense, right? Rather than having a solvent kind of try to wash through and get that stuff out um, and then evaporate and leave 20% lube, you might as well just use a little bit more lube, let that all run through and you're leaving 100% lubricant behind. Um, it also just continues to show the power of the hot melt uh, submersive waxes in flushing the dirt uh, and water and everything else out of the chain um, after it's been used without even having to set it. Another question that was asked, um, you know, if he is just relubricating in hot melt, um, you know, every 300 K, 300K or whatever, uh, is the wax being contaminated? And the way the test is run, yes, that is being contaminated. But if you think about it, you know, a gram or two of dirt in your 500 grams of wax, it's going to take a lot of rewaxings. Um, to, to build up enough dirt where you're probably gonna see much of a change in performance. And so I think that is another thing that really speaks to the, the power of these hot melts is that, um, you know, ideal world, you're cleaning the chain before you re-hot melt it, but you know, we've all done it. I, I know I've certainly had a long wet ride, gotten in, thrown it in the, in the instant pot, you know, just let it go. Um, it's gonna take a ton of rewaxings of a dirty chain to affect the wax in a way um, that I think you're gonna see a lot of loss in performance. And, and even with that, I mean, some of these, you, you would have to have a, a quadrupling or a quintupling of wear just before you even get to like the best of the wet lubes or the best of the drip lubes. So um, I really want you guys to come in here, look at this wear by block and really look at that. And I think, you know, hey, what's best dry dusty conditions? Well, let's look at block two and then of the best of block two, which of them are doing really well in block three. Um, same thing for wet conditions riding. What are the best of the lubricants in wet conditions? Uh, and then which ones have the, the best performance in block five? Um, again, uh, hot wax really just dominates these categories. Um, but if you're not hot waxing, you know, the couple of top drip waxes from above, uh, the Silka stuff, the ceramic stuff, uh, the true tension is good. The one thing I, I think I called out in the first one, but I will, he's got tr the true tension race, um, has DA next to it. That's the double application. True Tension Race is a fascinating product to me. It's a really good product. It's fast. Um, but the double application thing, he is literally, to get these results, applying it twice as frequently. So about every 100 kilometers or so. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's a good product, but it's really only a product to commit to if you're willing to be relubricating it at really pretty high intervals. Um, Okay, so we're gonna come down from that. Below that, he's got uh, what we call cost to run. And cost to run, to me, is an important one. I think it, it's just fun to look at. He's assuming an Ultegra drivetrain here. Um, and basically, he's looking at, okay, the lubricant cost what it cost. And I know everything that Silka makes, people say, oh, it's so expensive. Um, and, and the same is true for, you know, $40 for a bag of wax, that's so expensive. And then you come in here and see that we're amongst the lowest cost to run. Uh, lubricant in the market, and that's because this $40 bag of wax is going to save you, uh, you know, per 10,000 K, it's saving you one or two chains and maybe one cassette and, you know, maybe over 20,000 K, it's saving you a set of chain rings. Um, and so what he has factored in here is essentially how frequently you're wearing out chains and then how frequently those worn out chains are going to wear out cassettes and then chain rings. Um, and so you can see down here, he's got cost per 10,000 K, how much of that is lubricant, how many chains are being consumed, what those chains cost, um, how many cassettes or fractions of a cassette are being consumed and at what cost. You can play around here um, and really add some of your own numbers. You know, I think someone in the last video called me out um, and said that I was way over inflating the cost of AXS chains and cassettes. And, uh, he was mentioning, I think, a red cassette was, you know, $275 and the, the chain was $75, um, you know, and not the 600 I had said. But if you look, the new T-Type Eagle um, SL or XX or whatever SRAM is calling it, 
Uh, cassette is $600 MSRP, uh, and that chain is $150 MSRP. So that is $750 in those two components. Um, and then if you're running one by, right, one by setups kill rings twice as fast as two by setups. Um, we all know that. We all see it. You know, some of these uh, professional mountain bike, uh, UCI World Cup mountain bike guys, I mean, they were replacing chain rings every race uh, if it's dusty or muddy, and, you know, most of them are. So, I mean, this really is a way to think about, um, you know, the, the cost to run is not uh, just the cost of the lube. There's more to it than that. So please come in here, take a look. I mean, like I said, really parse through it for yourself. Um, you know, of course, I'm going to say my product is awesome. Um, there's other great products out there to take a look at. I'm the first one to say it. Adam talks about them in his data set. Um, what I'll go into next, and, and not exactly covered here, but we can sort of use uh, the data here to help us through this. The, the biggest question we get are people saying, hey, you know, I'm going to do an Unbound or 200 or the Unbound XL, or I'm going to do this, um, you know, 180 mile race across, you know, the state or, or whatever. Um, you know, what should I do if it rains? What's my best option? And, you know, your best option really in these ultra long events from our experience, and this is what we have our pro athletes doing and, and what we're suggesting to our customers who write into us in the inbox. I mean, really, you can see that uh, you are just best off to start out with a hot waxed chain. Um, there is all that, the chatter, you know, wax doesn't work in the wet, wax doesn't work in the mud. Well, the data here show the wax works excellently in, uh, in the mud, in the rain. Like we said in the last video, it just doesn't mask the fact that it stops working like a wet lubricant does. Um, and you inevitably are going to hit a spot in your event where you are going to want to uh, re-lubricate the chain. And, and part, partly you're re-lubricating because you want to flush out the dirt and contamination and the, the that's in there. Um, and that's no matter what you're using, right? And so in these instances, you know, we can see the drip on waxes, all of which, which have a curing time, um, I think the shortest of them is probably in the four hour range, you know, the ceramic speed stuff, our stuff does better with eight plus hours of cure. Um, I think the Affetto stuff is kind of in the same boat. You want about 12 hours of cure. Um, that's not going to be a great option here, but what you can do is start with your hot wax chain, right? It's going to get you that first 200 K or 180 K or whatever that looks like for you. You're going to start to hear it. Um, and then when you have a moment, I mean, you don't even have to get off the bike, a little bottle of Synergetic, um, you know, right here, <laughs> your little Synergetic, um, you know, we have people who buy little tiny, like the half ounce bottles off Amazon, um, put it in there. You can literally just go down as you're pedaling and run it right over the top uh, of the chain ring. And that is going to help flush out some of the dirt that gets in there and some of the other crap, but it is also going to uh, you know, add lubrication, it's going to quiet things down, and it's going to, uh, you know, really help your cause for the rest of the race. But I like to think of it as, you know, it's not quite a chain reset, but you are starting from a pretty clean uh, chain that has just gotten dry and had a lot of the wax flake off. You're not going to have a lot of dirt and dust stuck to that chain, and now you're almost starting from zero with a wet lube, um, but at kilometer 150, right? Whereas if you start with a wet lube, um, you are going to be picking up and attracting and, and, and holding on to whatever dirt lands on that uh, up until the point that you need to re-lubricate. So I'd say if you're going to wet lube, um, I would re-lubricate re <laughs> um, every 100K if possible uh, to really try to keep the, the chain clean and flushed or start with hot wax, move to wet, um, and then do that once or twice through the rest of the event um, to to really get you the, the benefit that you need. Again, th these wet, quiet, ultra durable, ultra long lasting lubes, uh, air quotes, in these conditions really are not as long lasting as they seem. Um, you just don't realize that they're doing the damage that they're doing or causing the friction that they're, they're causing because you know, it's that least noticeable difference. Like humans, we are not capable of picking up on three, four, five watts of additional friction in the drivetrain, um, but we, 
are very good at listening. And, uh, you know, we think it's quiet and it must be running smooth. It must be running at low friction. It must be uh, relatively clean. And these, and I think to some extent, sadly, the, the better the wet lube is, um, the more it, it masks when it starts to break down and not work. So um, we've got a ton of those questions. Long distance events, I would start on hot wax or, or even start on a, an advanced drip wax um, and then carry a small bottle and be ready to move to a wet lube if uh, and or when that uh, wax lubricant begins to break down. So don't think of it as, um, you know, it, it, it stops working. Think of it as, hey, it's getting me to a new starting point at which I can apply the wet lube and, and then work from uh, those intervals there. So. I think that's it. I think I'm probably under 15 minutes uh, filming this one in here by myself, so I don't have a timer. I'm not quite sure, but I, uh, I beat you, Adam, at uh, <laughs> I mean, less, than, uh, less than I said last time. And yeah, please keep leaving your comments, leaving your questions. Uh, hit the like uh, and subscribe buttons below and let us know the topics that you want to hear about uh, and know more about, and we will make sure to get them up on our channel. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.